In San Diego, California, they remember Sol Trujillo. I've come here because it's the last place in the United States Mr. Trujillo held a full-time position. Between late 2000 and early 2003, he was the CEO and chairman of a technology company called Graviton. The company was housed here in this building at La Jolla, San Diego's Silicon Valley. Investors believed its cutting edge technology promising enough to pour 60 million US dollars into the company. Graviton hired Sol Trujillo to take the company to the next level. And how did he perform? I'd say he performed dismally. Um, it was uh, it was awfully, uh, it was kind of a shame uh, because we had a lot of uh, very, very bright uh, research engineers um, working very hard on developing technology and, and I think we were making some progress. Graviton uh, in terms of management and uh, product development strategy was the most dysfunctional startup company I've ever worked with. Concerns quickly emerged among some employees that Mr. Trujillo didn't fully appreciate Graviton's technology. I remember his famous comment to the RF engineers, radio is radio, there's nothing new in radio. And they, I looked over at them and they were shocked. I hear they were developing new things in radio and he was telling them, well, why are you doing that? It's the same old stuff, it shouldn't be any problem. Wasn't that a core part of Graviton's strategy? Absolutely, radio? absolutely. Graviton was still developing its technology and had no sales, but Sol Trujillo rapidly increased the size of management. Do you think for a startup company it was top heavy? Extremely top heavy. It was extremely top heavy. There weren't enough groups, there weren't enough departments within the company to support, you know, 11 vice presidents and directors. It's absolutely very, very top heavy. Just over two years after Sol Trujillo took over at Graviton, the company had burnt through nearly all its money and was heading for collapse. Instead, it was bought out by another company. At the National Press Club earlier this year, Sol Trujillo blamed the demise of Graviton on the dot-com crash at the start of this decade. You can look at Sun, you can look at Cisco, you can look at Microsoft, you can look at virtually every company in that period of time, they lost value. In the case of Graviton, we built a great product, ready to go to market. The problem is in that period of time, post Y2K, nobody was buying. But Rudy Fisher disagrees that Graviton was simply a victim of its times. Absolutely not. I think it would have succeeded. Um, I think that uh, with the money that we burned through, if we had managed it better um, and developing the technology, we would have made a lot of traction uh, in the marketplace. So the difference between Graviton succeeding and failing really came down to Sol Trujillo? Not totally, but to a great extent, I think it did, yes. Well, clearly Sol Trujillo didn't get his job at Telstra because of his performance here in San Diego with Graviton. Far more relevant was the 25 years he spent with US West, one of America's largest telephone companies. At least it used to be. It was based in Denver, Colorado. So that's where I'm off to next. They also remember Sol Trujillo in Colorado. Between 1995 and 2000, he headed US West the state's largest private employer. Walk through downtown Denver and you can still see its old headquarters dominating the skyline. It now bears the name of the company that took it over. US West was the dominant telephone carrier across 14 US states, operating as a regulated monopoly across significant areas. In the 1990s, it attracted the nickname US Worst. Diane Callahan was the administrative director at the Office of Consumer Council, a government body representing the interests of utilities customers. What they did to their customers is really pretty appalling. Um, there were people who went out of business, who had small businesses in urban areas, not just rural areas, both. 
and they couldn't get customers because their customers couldn't reach them. They didn't have phone service at all. In October 1999, Diane Callahan gave evidence before the Public Utilities Commission of Colorado, stating, I conclude that US West has failed to inform consumers when it can provide service and when it cannot. It does not provide service to many of its customers in a timely manner. It appears to be ignoring obligations to provide service as a provider of last resort. It does not maintain its network at a level acceptable to consumers and fails to respond to its customers' request for accurate, complete information. There were people who, of course, trained their children to call 911 in an emergency, and there was no way to access 911. You're kidding, even 911 didn't work? No, not 911, not anything. I decide it's time to head out into the back blocks, where US West had an obligation to supply basic telephone services. Near a fly speck on the map called Peyton, I find Dwight Havercorn. How you doing? Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. <laughs> Dwight gives me a tour of the area and recounts how it took 11 months to get a phone connected after he bought here in October 1998. If we had a need of an ambulance or a fire truck or the county sheriff's office for some reason, uh, we had no means in which to get a hold of them. We found a lot of the other neighbors having the same problems. As Dwight later recounted to a public inquiry, US West constantly reassured him his connection was imminent. It did give him a mobile phone, but he says he had to drive up to 20 kilometers to get a signal. Two or three months later, I'm not sure just when it was, I ran into a a repairman for U.S. West that was out here in the area working on uh, some of the equipment that's buried in the ground. And uh, he was an older gentleman and we had a nice long talk and he just told me, he says flat out, the reason I didn't have phone service is there wasn't any to be had because it was going to require laying another cable. The services were full and that's not what uh, U.S. West had been telling us. They just said that there were little technical problems and things to be done at some time in a uh, a later fashion. This document confirms that at the time of Dwight's problems, US West had an official policy of not informing residential customers if delays in installing a new line were likely. Customer not educated, CNE, was actually a policy that US West had. We had a copy of the policy which essentially said don't tell the customer whether we have facilities available or not when they call up and ask for phone service. I, I've taken that information from you and, and, and surely we're going to be asking the company just those questions. I've come to the offices of the Colorado Public Utilities Commission. The job of its staff, in part, is to receive complaints from the public and ensure utility companies are meeting their service obligations. We'll try to figure out if they have an issue that we regulate yep. and if if they do, we take that information, we inquire the company. The company's got a couple of weeks by rule to respond to us. And we share that information with the customer. If they have a problem that we can fix, of course, we try to do that as well. The Commission also has the power to sit as a tribunal, conducting inquiries and enforcing service standards. US West was a private company, but as Colorado's dominant phone company, it was required to meet certain obligations including providing remote area customers with basic telephone service. In return, it was allowed to charge set rates in urban areas to cover the costs. In mid-1999, the Commission initiated proceedings investigating whether the company was in breach of its service obligations. The period of investigation covered 16 months, from January 1998 to April 1999 a period when Sol Trujillo was CEO and chairman of US West. The Commission's own staff testified that at a time when demand for phone services was booming, US West investment in plant and equipment was declining. Staff believes the current situation is a result of a purposeful policy decision by the company. 
That decision resulted in underfunding of network plant and equipment and of repair. Consequently, service availability and quality has suffered. For USWC, it is currently cheaper and more profitable to provide poor quality service than to expend the resources necessary to meet the established standards and to provide service in a timely manner. Three days after Dr Langland's testimony, Sol Trujillo announced what he described as the most sweeping service initiative in the company's history, saying, a portion of our customers aren't getting the level of service they expect to receive and that I expect to provide. Company management testified that US West met customer service levels in the vast majority of cases. Substantial growth in Colorado and increased order volume mean some customers do not receive the experience we strive to attain. In early 2000, the Commission delivered its verdict. It found US West had liberally violated the telecommunications service quality rules. We find that US West Communications breached its obligations to provide adequate service during the show cause period. Consequently, we conclude that US West Communications rates were excessive during that period. The Commission ordered US West to refund more than $11 million to customers. But there was nothing for people like Dwight Havercorn, who'd waited more than six months for a phone. The Commission ended up doing nothing at all for those health service order customers. We recommended that they take the company to court and impose civil penalties. The Commission's never done that and they didn't do that in this case. Diane Callahan recalls Sol Trujillo's attitude towards the regulators. In one meeting that the commissioners had with him and with, uh, with his attorney, and the commission was bearing down on them, probably on the service quality issue. I don't remember all the details. And um, Saul Trujillo didn't appreciate that very much, so he and his attorney stood up, put their coats on, and marched out of the hearing room. It was extraordinary, um, very dramatic. So they just stormed out? They just stormed out, you know, kind of, we don't have to listen to this, and off they went. They didn't have to listen to the state regulatory authority that's no. been in power to oversee telecommunications. Nope. What did the Commission think of it? I, the Commission was in shock. I mean, you could see that they were just shocked that this had occurred. Michael Feely was the leader of the Democratic Party in the State Senate during the late 1990s. He says Sol Trujillo and US West had little to fear from the Commission. In my estimation, sort of a very cosy relationship between the regulators and the regulated company, and I mean cosy to the point where people would literally go back and forth between one and the other, and for a hundred years they were the only game in town when it came to telephone services. And US West did not have the best, um, the best service record. And at worst, they got slaps on the wrist from the Public Utilities Commission. I think the Public Utilities Commission had far more discretion to take, uh, to take notice and to do things to correct these service problems, but they chose not to, largely, I think, because of that cozy relationship. Michael Feely says that as head of the largest private employer in the state, Sol Trujillo held tremendous political sway. I think that the culture at US West, which Saul grew up in, was one of getting your way. I think that uh, he was not, he doesn't broach disagreement at all. And he was very used to having a cooperative regulatory authority with which he worked. So Saul got his way pretty much most of the time. And it wasn't just the regulator US West had a cozy relationship with. The company held significant influence with lawmakers. Indeed, some of its staff were also members of the state legislature. At a Mexican restaurant in Denver's suburbs, I meet Rob Hernandez. At the time Sol Trujillo was head of US West, Rob was both a state senator and a US West employee. Um, US West was very supportive of their employees who were involved in the political process. So their policy was such that if you took time off work uh, so that the balance between what you're paid as a state senator and what your regular 
salary was should be should come out to the same at the end of the year, and they would consolidate all of that at the end of the year. Oh, okay. So you didn't lose money by I didn't, didn't make any money, but I didn't lose money either. Okay. The idea was to keep me financially whole. Rob says it wasn't always easy being both a lawmaker and a U.S. West employee, especially when it came to voting on issues affecting the phone company. Now, some people thought that that might be a conflict because, it, well, how can you be up there handling votes when you're working for the phone company? And then are you doing something for your pals? You know, Well, I came under criticism for that a lot. AT&T got very angry with me one time and just was screaming for my head and wanted me to resign and said it was a conflict of interest and, and you know, so they chose to be highly critical of me and that, that was okay. With the situation in Colorado looking more complex by the minute, I decided to head to one of the states where regulators did take stronger measures against US West. They remember Sol Trujillo in Oregon as well. In particular, I'm interested in what they remember in rural areas. I reach Oak Ridge, where Sue Bond is the mayor. We had very poor service. Our service was out 20% of the time at least, um, more in the winter. Um, the lines were poor, the connections were poor. Uh, a lot of static on the lines. So when you say out, just, you mean they just didn't work? They just didn't work, yeah. 20% of the time? I would say 10 to 20% of the time. In Oak Ridge, there weren't enough lines. Further south in Roseburg, the problem was an antiquated analog switch that couldn't cope with growing traffic. The crisis came to a head in 1999 as customers weren't able to get calls through. In an affidavit to the Oregon Public Utilities Commission, the area's principal hospital stated that doctors in the emergency room weren't able to phone physicians at the state's major teaching hospital in Portland for consultation. The head of the Oregon Public Utilities Commission described the situation as life-threatening. Local reporter John Sewell says it wasn't just the hospital that was affected, in nearby Sutherland, emergency calls weren't getting through to the police. Yeah, it was more than just an inconvenience for residents that wanted to talk to somebody else. Really, in some cases, you were talking about life and death situations that, that needed to be dealt with, and yet people weren't able to, to get through on their phones. John Sewell says US West simply didn't predict the leap in demand caused by dial-up internet connections. But that assertion that US West didn't predict increased demand doesn't wash with Oregon state regulators. No, that, these guys are professionals. They've been forecasting demand and meeting it for a hundred years. Now to all of a sudden have it all fall apart? No, they had, they had the expertise and they didn't use it. So this was a deliberate? I would say. It's a big claim, but Woody Burko says his opinion is based on facts. He says three years before the Roseburg Exchange started collapsing under the weight of demand, US West technicians identified it as in need of replacement and even got as far as putting it in the next year's construction schedule. 1996, US West comes to you and says what? We need increased depreciation rates to, uh, de to write down 13 large analog switches so we can replace them by the year 2000. So they're saying we need digital switches, we need some sort of compensation for, for, for changing to digital. Yes. And what was the response? Well, we granted them the increased depreciation rates of $14 million a year. And did they replace them? Of the 13 switches, they replaced two of them in, the, in the, the, our, our large major metropolitan area, Portland. Uh, but in the rural, in the more rural areas, they did not replace them. And uh, 
Ro Roseburg be being one of them. You gave them the money for that? Yes. And then they just didn't do it? Correct. Testimony to the Colorado Public Utilities Commission indicates US West employed exactly the same strategy in that state. It was allowed to fully depreciate analog switches by the end of 1996 on the understanding they'd be replaced. But as of October 1999, 13 of the switches were still in place. Joan Smith was Woody Burko's boss, a commissioner on Oregon's Public Utilities Commission. She too remembers Sol Trujillo. He could be very charming, uh, very attentive, very nice, and then just slash you to ribbons when you turn your back. And the evidence comes from his promises to invest in infrastructure in from 95 to 99 and, and make service better. Instead, it de continued to deteriorate. Joan Smith says service difficulties began to emerge in the early 90s, back before Sol Trujillo was in charge when regulation was relaxed. We um, had a special kind of regulation that allowed them flexibility and the ability to earn more money. But the service was so bad, we put a stop to that kind of regulation and initiated a case to see what their rates really ought to be. And in the process of assessing what rates ought to be, we discovered that they were overcharging $240 million. Uh, of course, that rate case went to court, but eventually, by 1999, customers were refunded $240 million. And that's partly because they didn't deliver and partly because they overcharged. Back in Colorado, the same thing was happening. Yet it wasn't just remote rural areas that were suffering. The state was booming, and the valleys leading from Denver up into the Rockies were experiencing growing population. The problem was that they underinvested in the distribution facilities necessary to hook up new customers. And so you would have these unbelievable situations of a homeowner buying a new home in a subdivision only to find out that it was going to be months before that person could get phone service. A new phone service was meant to be connected within 150 working days, just over six calendar months. The Public Utilities Commission inquiry concluded that between January 1998 and April 1999, U.S. West violated this rule on more than 30,000 occasions, involving hundreds of customers. The Commission heard that different areas had been divided into gold, silver and bronze categories, with investment weighted towards the more lucrative areas. Now it's clear that Sol Trujillo didn't endear himself to everyone here in Colorado, but then again that wasn't his job. He wasn't being paid to make friends after all, he was being paid to make money for the shareholders of US West. And in that regard at least, he was highly successful. Well, I'd say he was very good at improving the, uh, you know, the share price. I mean, you know, during his term there, the, the price increased dramatically. Um, you know, his, his whole, I'd say that was his whole purpose actually there, was to increase the, the share price. Uh, he, you know, he very much wanted the company to be bought out, which it eventually was. So he positioned the company, you know, as a, as a high tech, you know, kind of provider of telecommunications. And in doing so, he, he dramatically increased the share price. So that was his strategy from the start, was it? To, to build it up to a position where it would be bought out? Yeah, I believe so. I mean, and, and certainly that's what wound up happening. Stuart Steer says that even while some traditional customers were experiencing difficulties, Sol Trujillo was adept at marketing US West as a go-ahead company. I think what he did is that he, cut, he dramatically cut back on the amount of money spent you know, serving customers and shifted a, a significant amount of that money into um, you know, the, some of the high-tech ventures that he was using to kind of portray the company as this cutting-edge you know, telecom company that was involved in, you know, in kind of this new era of telecommunications. The strategy was highly successful. 
with shareholders enjoying strong dividends and a booming share price. By early 2000, a company called Quest initiated a merger deal that effectively amounted to a takeover. But if Sol Trujillo had squeezed customers to get the best result for shareholders, in the end, the shareholders missed out, and Sol Trujillo didn't. When he's not riding his Harley, Curtis Kennedy is a campaigning lawyer. Over the years he's taken US West, its predecessors and its successor Quest to court some 70 times without losing a case, mostly on behalf of US West retirees whose pensions are tied to the Quest dividends. One of those cases revolved around the final days of US West as it closed the merger deal with Quest. US West announced its regular dividend, then effectively cancelled it. June 4th, the board of directors announced that they're going to pay the routine dividend to shareholders of record on June 30th. Within the next day or a day and a half later, the chief executive at Quest, Joe Nacho, writes a testy letter to Saul Trujillo and says, don't do that. Don't pay that dividend. If you pay that dividend, we're going to consider this a breach of the merger agreement. In response, the U.S. West Board, under the chairmanship of Sol Trujillo, moved the dividend date to July the 10th. This meant the dividend, totaling $270 million, was never paid, because by that time, U.S. West no longer existed. Meantime, the merger was consummated and closed on June 30th. But one day before the closure of the merger, the details were worked out for this exorbitant severance agreement for one man, and none of that was disclosed to anyone. No one had a chance to object and say it's out of line. And I think it's really telling that you would take care of yourself and not worry about the consequences of the decision that would have affected and benefited the lives of tens of thousands of people. It was only earlier this year that Curtis Kennedy found out just how much Sol Trujillo was paid out when he discovered this document in court records. It reveals that Sol Trujillo received more than $48 million as cash payment, another $13 million as a pension payment, and another $10 million in benefits, including $5.5 million for corporate aircraft and almost $2 million for office space. The total amount? over $72 million US, or $90 million Australian dollars. And that doesn't include in excess of 2 million stock options vested in Mr. Trujillo at the time of the merger, covering stock at that time worth more than $100 million US. In that situation, if shareholders didn't get their 53 cents per share, but Saul Trujillo walked out with 70 million. And then, you know, interesting, it's a, you know, coincidentally, the, the lawsuit that affected the rights of 10,000 thousands of people was settled for 50 million. So they're going to divvy up 50 million. Whereas one man walks away with over 70 million. That's not right. Nowadays, regulators say the phone service in Colorado, Oregon, and other former U.S. West states is up to scratch. Still, they remember Sol Trujillo in the United States. Some even say that one day, Australians will remember him as well. <laughs>